we have people in Canada, in Germany, in New Zealand, um, Illinois, Chicago, Indiana, uh, Maryland. Awesome. We've got people from all over. Of course, uh, Ron is in uh, Amsterdam. Um, keep sharing uh, where you're at, what you're drinking, and uh, feel free to, to chat in that chat room and, and keep the, the lively pub chatter uh, happening. Um, and we'll get started uh, with Ron here. And of course, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, share, uh, share anything you've got in the chat room. We're going we're gonna to mute you all as soon as uh, Ron gets started. And then um, after the fact, ask questions along the way. And then after the fact, um, we will uh, go ahead and get to those questions and do a little bit more chatter and, and keep going. But thank you all for joining. I'm Liz. I'm with the Chicago Bruseum. Um, I'm excited for this talk. I've been a, a big fan of Ron's for a long time and, and got to, to meet him a, a couple of times that he was here in Chicago doing things with Goose Island, uh, tugging at my, my beer history heart um, and uh, drinking his creations has been exciting and, and knowing a little bit more about him on Twitter. And of course now Ron is part of the Bruseum's League of Historians, uh, which I'm very excited about and honored that, that he's uh, joined our team. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot more from us and from Ron as we continue to do things. In fact, uh, I'll let you all know that, that we were going to make a big announcement um, in March, right when all of this craziness was happening, that the next uh, International Bruseum experience was going to be in London. And Ron was going to actually do this talk for us in London. Um, alas, things uh, didn't work out so well, but we promise we will actually get to London uh, with the Bruseum and a lot of our, our, our colleagues and amazing people who are over there doing some great work with beer history and culture and of course making great beer. Um, but so look out for that at some point in the, in the future when, when life gets back to normal. But with that, I'm going to mute myself and hide myself and I'm going to uh, let Ron uh, continue on the rest of the show. So Ron, it's all yours. Take it away. Yeah, I hope this is going to work. Okay. Um... Right, let's do a, can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, let's, let's kick off then. Um, yeah, this is my look at um, British beer styles through history. Um, yeah, I, I, I got very obsessed with beer when I was quite young. I've been a camera member since I was 18. And I had this very frustrating experience when I started buying lots of different beer books, when I saw that they kept giving all these different accounts of history and beer history. And I got very frustrated. I didn't know which ones I could believe, which ones were right. Um, when I found out that there was actually lots of hard information, if you could be bothered to go and look for it, um, then I started getting obsessed with doing that and really looking into the original information and getting my own real idea about what, what beer history was like. And one of the things I soon noticed was that a very high percentage of the stuff written about beer history was just made up rubbish, basically. It was just completely untrue. Um, so it was just things that people had assumed had existed or they guessed about. And really very bad and so i've been trying to put this right by doing my own investigations and, and really delving into the original records original sources so i can get the truth about what what the history was really like and this is one of the reasons i don't go really further back than about 1800 because then it gets a bit vague and certainly no further back than 1700 because then it's just not enough hard information for me um, so today I'm going to run through what you can see here. I'm not going to read it all out. So basically stuff about how beer was brewed, what it was brewed from, and what the beers were, what the styles were like, and how they changed over time. Because this is one of the interesting things about British beer styles is that they have been incredibly dynamic. And certainly over the past 200 years, they've changed Every decade or so, there have been significant changes to beers. 
So th there's, there's no one thing. So if anyone ever says, oh, traditional beer is like this, my uh, immediate question would be, well, when do you think traditional was? Because if you're not giving a specific date, that's just being incredibly vague and doesn't tell you anything. Um, so that, you know, beer in 1850 was different from beer in 1800, different from beer in 1900. I mean, beer in 1914 was very different from beer in 1920. So it, it's always been changing. Um, and yeah, the styles, we'll, we'll get to them later. They're, they're quite fun, the styles. Um, malt, most beers used to be fairly simple. Most, most beers used to just have base malt and nothing else. And the only except, so up until about the, the late 18th century, when you start having some changes in port of grist, basically beers were only made from one type of malt. And there's a fairly restricted number of malts. So in the 18th century, only really had pale amber and brown malt, maybe white malt, which is the really pale one. And then you start getting a few more in the, in the uh, 19th century, but it's still quite limited. And then at the end, end of the 19th century, you get crystal malt, um, but it's still quite a small number of different types of malts. And most beers wouldn't have any of these in. Most beers just had pale malt. Um, hops. British beer was well known for being very heavily hopped, which isn't what people associate with it nowadays, but that was the case. British beer was the most heavily hopped in the world. British brewers used hops in very specific ways, mostly as a preservative, not necessarily for flavor. So they'd, when they were putting together a recipe, what they'd be thinking about, what's this beer gonna do? So if this is a beer that's gonna be sold quite young, then I don't need to put this many hops into it. If I'm gonna be either storing this for many months because I'm making an aged beer, or if I'm going to be exporting this, then I am not going to, um, you know, I'm going to put loads of hops into it because that's what it needs. Why's that just moved up there? I uh, don't know why that is. Um, you, you get this crazy thing. After 1850, because you've got the British population expanding and brewing being very big, British agriculture cannot keep up with the demands of British brewing. So you see large quantities of hops being imported. There's a certain point in the 19th century where Britain was using half of the whole world's hop crop. So 50% of all the hops grown in the world were used in the UK. It's, it's fairly staggering to think that, but it's because Britain was brewing lots of beer and it was brewing lots of beer with lots of hops in. So you get hops that come from every single country that, that, that grew hops, um, but large quantities of North American hops because they were cheap, they had high bittering quantities, so you didn't use, need to use as many. And so they were very popular in the UK, even though people hated the flavor of them. So they didn't like how they tasted. They'd use them as early copper hops. You very rarely see them ever used as, as dry hops. For that, they'd use the classier English varieties. But you also see all sorts of hops that they thought were rubbish being used. So Belgian hops, which were the cheapest, which they thought were crap, they still used them because they were cheap and they needed lots of hops. Um, New Zealand, everywhere. They were bringing in hops from everywhere. It's, it's really odd when you see it. Um, sugar becomes a big thing. Um, you used to have a Reinheitsgebot in, in Britain. So um, for most of the time, you weren't allowed to use anything other than uh, malt hops, uh, um, yeast and water. The reason being that the tax was, was mostly on the malt and the hops. So if people started using other fermentables, they were basically dodging tax. So people didn't like this. I mean, the story that some of you might have heard about Guinness using roast barley because it wasn't taxed and all this stuff, complete nut of bollocks. If they'd done that before 1880, they would have had massive fines if they'd been caught and probably a lot of their brewing equipment confiscated and it might have sent them out of business because governments generally, they get fairly upset when you try to avoid the tax that they want from you. So you couldn't really do that. Um, but after 1847, sugar's allowed in beer, doesn't really take off initially. Some brewers experiment with it a bit in the 1840s, some of the London brewers, and then 
sort of dropping again. And it's only after 1880 when you have the free mash to that, when basically you can use anything that's a safe ingredient in beer, then there's a huge explosion in the use of sh sugar. And not be, for the reason that most people might think of nowadays, just because it was cheap, but it was used for very specific purposes. In the case of pale ales, it was, made, uh, it was used to keep them light and with a very pale color. And so you'll see the weird thing in the late 19th century the most expensive beers, the pale ales, have more sugar in them than the cheap mild ales do. And it's because sugar isn't being used because it's a cheap ingredient, it's being used for other reasons. And people have often misunderstood this about British brewing, about the role of sugar. Um, and then what you have eventually come around is these standard types of invert sugar, number ones, two, three, and four, which are used for different purposes. So you've got one and two is mostly used in pale ales, one in the poshest pale ales, two in the sort of less quality ones, three mostly in uh, mild ales, and four in, in porter and stout. And, and one of the things you see is that after they introduce all these types of sugars, then you see colours becoming more subtle in beers. So whereas before you only ever had pale or really dark beers, then you start getting these beers that are in in between shades because the brewers have a lot more control because they're not dependent on the malt. They, and they can specifically color correct with caramel or def, different types of sugars. So they can hit any color they want, which would probably have been harder if they've been trying to do it just pure malt. Um, free mash to act allowed adjuncts, which I use the old fashioned definition by adjunct, I mean unmalted grain. Um, initially, quite a few people used flight rice, which is an interesting one, um, something which was also popular in Germany, which might surprise people. Um, rice was a very popular adjunct in North Germany when they hadn't been fettered by the uh, shackles of the Reinheitsgebot. Um, it's my suspicion that using rice in lagers was introduced to the United States from Germany, um, which probably isn't what people would expect. Um, during World War II, they go over to flake barley because they grew loads of barley and it was cheap to produce because you didn't have to use as much energy uh, malting it. And so you see loads and loads of flake barley in, in the end of World War II. Most beers, 10 to 15%. Uh, right. Yeast, I mean, if you see the way <laughs> some traditional breweries ha handle yeast, it, it, it's quite shocking. Um, I went round Harvey's, which is one of my favourite breweries, and they have God knows how many yeast strains are actually in there pitching yeast, because they just have buckets of the yeasts uh, around the brewery. They've been repitching for 50 years, so they don't really have the yeast bank, they just keep repitching it. They say sometimes it goes strange then it normally comes back again, or always comes back again eventually. So, I mean, British brewers had a strange attitude towards yeast. And most of the time they'd have had Britannomyces in there, uh, just because they would have picked it up. And if they didn't have Britannomyces there, they'd have had it in their wooden equipment. So, and this was one of the reasons why British brewers wouldn't go over to pure yeast cultures, because when they were trying, first trying to do this in the late 19th century, when, they were still producing a lot of stock beers. When they started using pure yeast cultures, they were saying, well, we can't get the secondary conditioning to work. And obviously it was because in their actual pitching yeast, they'd had Britannomyces. And when they just went to the pure Saccharomyces, then obviously it couldn't do the secondary conditioning anymore. And so it really put British breweries off using single yeast strains. And they really didn't start doing that I mean, there's still loads that don't do that. There's still plenty of British breweries that have multiple yeast strains. Um, um, Adnams is a good example. They have two yeasts. Fuller's always had three yeasts in their strains until the 1970s when they standardized on one. So it's very late that people went over to pure yeast strains in, in Britain. Mashing. Um, Mashing is much more complicated than people think it was. And multiple mashes in British brewing, uh, well, I'm going to be 
more specific about this, you have to differentiate, differentiate between English and Scottish brewing because the Scottish brewers, they're the ones that invented what people think of as the classic British technique of brewing, which is a single infusion with sparges. Um, and that you get that sort of around 1830, 1840 in Scotland. It takes a long time for that sort of brewing to catch on. And in some breweries, they never brewed like that. Um, so you see that people are still using multiple mashes in London right up until the in, in, into the 20th century. They're using multiple mashes. And the classic form of what I would call the classic um, form of English mashing, lighter one, is what I call an underlet mash, which is where you do initial infusion and then after half an hour you have you bring in water from the bottom of the mash, which is hotter. So you get a sort of step mash and then you leave it for two hours and then you sparge. And that was really, really common in, in British brewing and goes right up until the 1970s, 1980s, people were brewing like that. So it's not as easy, not as simple as the history books would normally tell you that people go over to this single, single infusion. M most British breweries never went over to a single infusion. Um, and then party guiling, which is, it's, it's always fun party guiling. I've had so many amusing arguments about party guiling with, uh, mostly with American home brewers who had the completely wrong idea about what party guiling is. Party guiling after about 1780 or 1750 was never the thing of first runnings one beer, second runnings another beer, third runnings another beer. That just wasn't the way people brewed. But that, that's a really primitive form of party guiling. People had a very sophisticated method of it, which is why you have two, three or four warts, you hop and boil them all separately, and then post boil, you blend them together so you can get exactly the gravity of, that you want, and also so that you can brew loads of beers of different gravities from the same, from one, one brew. So you can see as many as four beers done from a single brew all of different gravities, but all with exactly the same recipe to start with. And it's a very efficient way of brewing. It's also why a brewery like Fuller's could have this beer called Old Burton Extra, where they, the largest batch of it I've ever seen, this is a brewer that, beer they had in the interwar period, largest batch of that I've ever seen is 10 barrels. Their brewing kit, their brew length, their standard brew lengths was about 300 barrels at the time. There's no way they could have brewed that single guile. The only way they could brew it was because they party guiled it with other beers. So it's a way of being, out, of, of being able to use your brewing kit very flexibly. So you can brew small batches of beers on a large brewing kit with it still being efficient. And so you see that the London brewers, basically they'd have three recipes. You have a pale ale recipe, a mild recipe, and a porter and stout recipe and they might make 12 or 15 beers out of that but there'd still only be three basic recipes that they brewed and they brew all the beers in different combinations with each other. <coughs> um, boiling, I mean the typical London thing early 19th century is you'd have four warts for your porter and stouts you, uh, and the boils would be one, two, three, and four hours. So the first wort would only get an hour, and the last wort would get four hours. Um, the reason being that you want to concentrate the OG, and also in the case of porter breweries, you'd be wanting to increase the colour by having a long boil. And that's why you see that London breweries and Burton breweries had different sorts of coppers. So London breweries would have a domed copper so that you get more pressure inside and you get a bigger increase in colour. Whereas Burton Brewers didn't want that, they wanted to keep a pale colour, so they had open coppers. Um, fermentation. Um, British breweries were configured exactly the opposite way round to modern breweries. So the proportion between the brew house and the fermenting vessels was completely different. So whereas you see nowadays a brewery might have to, the fermenting vessels are at the minimum the same size as the brew house. Whereas in the old days, you might have 
a 500 barrel mash tun, but you'd be fermenting in 20 or 50 barrel fermenters. So one batch of beer would go into a large number of multiple fermenters. Um, so it's, it's like the Burton breweries. I mean, Bass were brewing beer on a massive scale, but they had 20 to 50 barrel fermenters, even though their batches were a thousand barrels. And the other thing you have to realize <coughs> is that, with, that in the 19th century, breweries always had a two-stage fermentation. So you had the fermentation proper, and then you had cleansing. And so cleansing was basically designed to remove the yeast from the, from the uh, fermenting beer. And you had various systems of that. Um, the best known ones, ones are probably Burton Unions and the Yorkshire Square. Um, so Burton beers, when you were brewing an IPA in Burton, you, you wouldn't put it straight into the unions. It would go into a round fermenter first and then after a few days of fermentation, then it would go into the union, basically for, the, for yeast removal. Um, and you had another couple of systems, Pontos were the ones they used in London, which is like a primitive version of a, Yorkshire, of a, of a Burton union. And then you had the dropping system, which is where you had two vessels, one, one above the other, um, which was quite common in the south of England. But they all had the same same purpose really, which was to remove as much yeast as possible from the fermenting beer. Um, aging, I was, uh, when you see the old um, drawings of vats, they always put a figure in there, so just so you can see how huge these things were. And they really were enormous. But you see that they were only ever really used for, for aging porter, the really big fats. And then after 1850, it falls out of fashion. And then in the 1870s, it falls off a cliff. And basically by 1880, aged porter is dead. And all the vats, big vats are ripped out of the large London breweries. And they only keep some small vats for aging stout. Um, so it's really the end of mass aging of beer is the... Uh, is the 1870s. Uh, it's one of the interesting things that the, the beer that I, we, I mentioned earlier with Liz, the, the Obadiah Poundage, which was a, a beer I did with Goose Island, where we did a, a beer from the 1850s, where we did a, a mild porter and a keeping porter and then blended the two. And that was dead interesting, at least for me. Other people seemed to like it as well, so I was quite happy. Now we're going to move on to the beer styles. And um, the first real, in some ways, the, the proper really well-defined beer style, which was Porter, which is the beginning of industrial brewing and basically man, made London the capital of brewing for about 100 years. So where the largest breweries were, where the most advanced technological breweries were. So, so basically, the place for brewing. Um, it, only, it could only happen because of the specifics of London in that even in the 18th century, you've got a very large population in London. So I think it hit a million people in the 18th century. And because transport was quite primitive back then, it was the only place that was really practical to brew beer on a large scale, just because everyone was close together and you had a large enough number of beer drinkers concentrated so that you could brew on a large scale. But I mean, you see the amount of beer that the, they were brewing. I mean, the large London breweries in, in the 18th century, and there were several of them, were brewing over 200,000 barrels a year, when probably the largest brewery on continental Europe was a tenth of that size. So it's a completely different scale to everyone else. Um, Three Threads, that's a complete bollocks story. Um, one of the reasons we called the beer Obadiah Poundage was Ob Obadiah Poundage, unfortunately, is the man who inadvertently uh, caused the Three Thread story, but it's a complete misinterpretation of this 18th century letter where someone explains quite well about the history of Porter. Um, and people have completely misunderstood some of the things he said. 
and seemed to think it was a combination of three bears, but it's complete bollocks. The original porter was um, a, a moderately aged bear. Before porter, the London brewers didn't age bear. They, they shipped it out straight after primary fermentation, but other people would age it. And then at a certain point they realized, well, you can get more money for the aged beer, so maybe we should be doing this ourselves. And so they go over to aging um, their brown beer, initially probably just for about five or six months. Um, they noticed that the, the larger the size of vat, the better, or the, the more smoothly the beer ages, for, for, for a variety of reasons, which I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with now. Um, and so they started this arms race with the vat. Some of it was just like, I've got a bigger one than you have, but it, it did make some sense that to, to, it's a sign of just the scale they were brewing on. But the initial ones were what you call brown beer, so heavily hopped, 100% uh, brown malt, quite simple beers, about 1070, about six and a half, seven percent alcohol. So a, a reasonably strong beer. What the, the big thing that you have in the late 18th century is you've got a combination of factors. So you've got these large industrial breweries in London, you've got war with the French, and you've got technological advances. And so what happens is the, the tax on malt's going up to pay for the war with the French. And so for brewers, there's a big incentive to cut down your malt bill to use less malt. At the same time, this is just when they're starting to use hydrometers so they can see what extract they're getting. And people notice that even though pale malt's more expensive, it actually works out cheaper because there's better extract from it. And so they start changing their grists, putting more and more pale malt in. And so by the end of the 18th century, you're looking at, a, it's gone from being 100% brown to just 40% brown and 60% pale. And also the walls knocked down the gravity. So what you have is that they wanting to put more and more pale malt in because they, they want to brew as efficiently as possible, but they're struggling with the color. And so in the early 18th, 19th century, they're allowed to use um, basically a sort of caramel only to color porter, no other beers. The government sort of thinks that the brewers are cheating them. So they banned this in 1816. And the next year you have patent malt invented, so black malt, which solves everyone's problem. And so then you say, okay, they drop down the brown malt percentage even more, and they just use black malt to get the color that they need. Um, East India Port is one of my favorite ones. When I found out about this, it really blew my mind. And um, it goes completely against the normal story told about beer in India, which is, oh, you know, that they were shipping out all this IPA. And no, in, in, in actuality, if you look at the, I mean, I base this on the, the tenders for contract that the East India Company sent out. And there's one example of that there. And you can see that the porter is more than double the amount of IPA. And all the ones I found, it was similar to that. So I reckon that at least twice as much porter was exported to India as IPA. Um, it makes obvious sense because most of the people in India were just ordinary soldiers, the British people, and they weren't pale ale drinkers. It was the posh people who drank that. So it's the officers and the officials of the East India Company, they were drinking IPA, but the ordinary soldiers, they were drinking porter. And that's why it's been forgotten about because it was just ordinary people that were doing it and not the posh people. And it's amazing the way the story of East India Porter has been uh, until recently, no one seems to have ever spoken about it at all. And one of the reasons they wanted to give it to the soldiers was because th there's this great doctor who did this investigation to the death rates in the various units of the British Army in India and noticed that the ones where they drank porter, it was noticeably way lower than the ones where they drank rum. And so his recommendation was that they provided porter in the barracks so that the people wouldn't kill themselves drinking rum. Um, and so it was a huge deal in, in British India. And if you look through the newspaper reports and so if you can see plenty of mentions of porter, normally quite disparaging, but it was huge quantities of, where, of it were exported. And, I've, and the great thing is that I found brewing records for this. So 
you see ones like Whitbread where it specifically says contract porter and why it says contract porter is it's because it was a, a contract with the East India Company um, and so I've got brewing records from Truman's, Whitbread and Barclay Perkins where they were brewing beer specifically for the Indian market well brewing porter specifically for the Indian mar market um, what you find is I mean, I did this investigation where I just looked at price lists from various, from, from the end of the 19th century. And I could see that ordinary porter was really dying out in England after about 1880, 1890, other than in the southeast of England, specifically around London. So by the time you get to World War I, lots of breweries in, in Britain have dropped porter. They're still brewing stouts, but they're not brewing porter. Uh, but London's a real stronghold. And then World War I really messes it up because it drops the gravity of it. Um, it looks like people probably moved over to draft stout, which was about the same strength as draft porter. So, so, I mean, in 1914, draft porter was about 5% alcohol. When you get to the post-war period, it's 3 3.5%, whereas draft stout is still around 5% alcohol. And so my guess is, because you see the sales of stout go up, that some people just just um, upgraded to stout because that was like the porter that they used to drink. And draft stout was still common in London. Um, <coughs> so, um, I mean, it, it's hard to pin down exactly. It's probably about, in England, last porter was probably brewed 40, 41, 42, something like that. Um, Ireland, it carries on. Guinness keep brewing porter. Uh, up until the early 1970s, um, the weird two cask porter, which is, uh, I won't go into that now, but it's a, a wonderful thing seeing that it's served out of two different casks. Um, there's a brilliant thing from just when they were discontinuing it, a thing from Northern Ireland television where they're showing how it was served. It's really fascinating. Uh, Stout. Whatever anyone might tell you, stout's just the name for the stronger versions of porter. Stout and porter are exactly the same beer. Um, the whole thing about roast barley is just made up shit that people made up in the 70s or 80s. It's not true. Um, Guinness, when they still brewed a porter, it had roast barley in it as well. London brewers, they never really used roast barley very much. And if they did, they put it in the porter and their stout. Um, because they were party guiling porter and stout together in London, that meant the recipes had to be identical. So there's, any, anyone starts to tell you that there's this real definite distinction between porter and stout, they're talking out of their ass because it's not true. Um, there have always been basically the same thing, it's just that stout's the name for the stronger versions. Uh, yeah, there were loads of different stouts in the late 19th century. Barclay Perkins, my favorite brewery, they, they produce so many other things. Um, at all sorts of different strengths up to, from quite strong to totally crazy. Um, and these were some of the beers which were actually vatted for a long time. So you see Barclay Perkins, who brewed the original Russian stout, they claimed in the 1930s that, the, that it was aged for two years before being bottled. And I can believe they did that. Oatmeal stout. I'm just going to have a drink to it because my throat's getting a bit. Oatmeal stout. Um, it's one of these beer styles where you can really pin down exactly when it was invented because it, it's one brewery who did it, McClay's, which is a relatively small brewery in Aller in Scotland. And they came up with a an oat, oat malt stout in the late 19th century, tried to patent it, didn't get very far with that because lots of other people just cheated and just used not oat malt. And so they didn't call it, had to call it that. Um, the original ones, because I've got some brewing records from McClay's, I can say it's a really high malt, oat malt percentage, it's like 30%. London brewers, total joke. Um, Mostly they would throw in about 1% oats. And the other weird thing is because they were party guiling, 
they would be calling something oatmeal stout and another beer just stout, but they'd be identical. Um, and even worse than that, you'd have things like Whitbread when they were partly galing their oatmeal stout with Mackerson, they would have oats in their milk stout as well, but they wouldn't tell anyone that. Um, so it's really just a, a bit of a con actually, oatmeal stout. Um, the recipes I've seen, they have so such a small quantity of oats in them, they couldn't have had any actual effect on the flavour of the beer. Milk stout's another good one. There's really good documentation on how this, how and exactly when this was invented. So it's Mackeson, I think 1911, I think's the year. They have this weird thing where they were saying they were thinking of various ways of making stout more nourishing, including putting eggs in and stuff. And they eventually came up with lactose. So it became a big thing. They also patented it, Mackerson, and for a while seemed to be able to enforce their patent and license it out to other breweries to produce because they were quite small. And then it became this really big thing. Um, they were taken over by Whitbread, who was quite a large brewer, who started brewing it all over the place and really large quantities of it. So it became this really big thing. And then it became incredibly unpopular because it became like the stuff your granny would be drinking, which obviously isn't what most, peop most people under 30 want to do, is drink what their granny's drinking. Um, so it went incredibly out of fashion. And one of the weirdest things I've heard from us, and why I haven't ruled out Mild Ale making a comeback, is if you asked me the style least likely to make a resurgence, I would have said Milk Stout because it was so, so deeply unfashionable and such a, and a beer with such a poor image. And, and I still can't believe it. it's actually made a comeback. And there's trendy milk stouts nowadays, admittedly none of which actually tastes like the original milk stouts. Uh, IPA, it's always a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the origins are fairly obscure. And if people tell you, oh, it definitely comes from October beer, they're making it up because I haven't found anything that actually specifically says this. And I just think that what it was, it's just brewers doing what they always did. So they were making a, a pale ale and it was meant to be exported. So they put a, a load of hops in it just to try and protect it. Um, but it's... You have pale ale from earlier in the 18th century, which is completely different, which is incredibly lightly hopped. It's pale, it's brewed from 100% pale malt, but really nothing like what people think of pale ale or IPA today. Um, starts off with Hodgson, that, all that stuff's true about Hodgson here. He had pretty much a monopoly. He made a complete mess out of it by getting greedy. And so you get the, Bass Bre the, the uh, Burton brewers who move in because they've recently lost their export markets to, to Russia. And so they're interested in finding somewhere else to ship their beer. And, and they eventually take it over. But the quantities that they were sending aren't actually that huge. Um, when you're looking at 20,000 barrels a year, when you're talking about breweries that were brewing maybe 300,000 barrels, it's not a huge amount of beer. Um, so it was never massive, the, the, the Indian market for pale ale, even though there was money in it, and that's why people did it. Um, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, like this massive market that they had, because it was quite limited. It was only, you know, a few wealthy people. It's not like most Indians would ever get near IPA. Um, what was it like? Very pale, very heavily hopped. Uh, lots of dry hops as well. Where people normally, uh, I mean, what people, the normal story is that IPA, what did they do? They brewed it high in alcohol, high in hops, so it survived the journey. If you actually look at IPA in an early 19th century context, it's quite a weak beer. Um, if you look at bass, I know the, the, the gravities of all Bass's beers from the 1870s and their IPA was the equal lowest gravity beer that they brewed. Every beer apart from the weakest mild they made had a higher gravity than their IPA. 
So it wasn't a particularly strong beer. And that wasn't the point. People didn't want really strong beer in India. They wanted something relatively light. Um, but the really important thing about IPA and protecting it in the voyage is a really high degree of attenuation and the presence of Britannomyces. So if you see the way that they brewed bass, bass would be filled into barrels, put in the brewery yard, left for a year, out in the open, and then it would be put on the ship to India. And the idea was that you'd have had a really long secondary fermentation. You'd have taken out everything that was fermentable. So when it was on the voyage, there wasn't anything that was bad could, that could happen to it because there'd be nothing left for anything to be able to ferment. And so that was one of the really big um, defenses that it had, a really high degree of attenuation. And if you look at, I've got an analysis of bass where it's got a finishing gravity of like 1,002. So it's gone from 1,065 to 1,002. So it's like over 95% attenuation. So um, it's obvious that it hasn't just been saccharomyces. You can't get that much. Um, and I've seen analyses of past where they found, uh, from the 30s, where they found Britannomyces in it. So it's definitely what was going on. And it's one of the important things they had uh, in protecting um, IPA was the fact that you got Britannomyces and a really high degree of attenuation. And here's some examples. And if you look at these gravities, these are beers which were genuinely exported to, to India. And you see the highest gravity of any of them is 1070. And there's plenty of them that are under 1055. Um, so for the time, that's a very modest beer. Um, 1844, you know, pretty much every mild ale would be stronger than that. So what's striking about it is not how strong the beers are, but how weak they are. And these are IPA sold in Britain. You can see that some are even weaker, but generally very high degree of attenuation. Uh, so this is a slide I've had to change because <laughs> it used to say no evidence for a shipwreck selling it in the, in the UK. And then Martin Cornell actually managed to track down the details of the shipwreck where this actually happened. So this is true. But um, I've, I've seen some things in old literature and stuff where it seems that the people coming back from, the, from India had got quite a taste of IPA and they wanted, wanted it when they got back. And they seem to have been the sort of first um, consumers of IPA in Britain. And then it sort of took off. <coughs> But it was never a huge style in the 19th century. Some people will say, oh, you know, it went from porter to, to IPA and pale ale. Well, no, that's not what happened. Um, IPA and pale ale in the, in the 19th century, they were expensive, so more expensive for the strength than most other beers, and not what most people could afford. So most people were drinking mild. Um, so from 1850 to 19, 1960, mild was the most popular style. Pale ales become more popular as they become weaker and they become more reasonably priced. But certainly the full strength pale ales and IPAs were very much the stuff that the middle classes would be drinking, not the ordinary drinker. Um, what you see is that the old full strength pale ales had been stock ales, so things that were aged for probably at least six months, goes out of fashion in the 20th century. You only really get that with some of the uh, things like Bass and Allsop and Worthington, which were still the classy Burton brewed pale ales. They some remained stock ales, but pretty much everything else went over to being uh, running pale ales. What you also have is something that evolves around 1900 or so, that London breweries who initially didn't call out pale ales they introduced in the 1860s, pale, uh, IPAs, they called them pale ale. And then quite a few of them introduced a weaker beer around 1900, which was called IPA, which goes completely against what people think of the relationship between pale ale and IPA. Um, but that's what happened. And so you get things like, and, and a beer like Green King IPA, 
is actually part of a long tradition of session strength IPAs, which goes back for at least 100 years, well, more than 100 years. Um, so when I get really upset when people say, oh, Green King can't be called an IPA because it's too weak. Well, no, that's, there's, a, there's been beers like that for a very long time in England. So to say that they're not valid is a bit bollocky, really. Um, pale ale all comes from the introduction of, of Coke for, um, for kilning malt where you've got more control over the temperature so you can more consistently uh, produce a paler coloured malt. These start becoming popular in the 18th century but they're completely different from modern pale ales which are all based around IPA which has quite a different history. As I was saying the only way I can differentiate between pale ale and IPA when I look through um, old sources is what did the brewer call it? Uh, the only exception I make to this is Bass because they never called their beer IPA. They always called it pale ale, even though it was the classic IPA. Um, but other than that, I normally respect what the brewer called it because otherwise it's, it's impossible to split the two apart and, and you're just making arbitrary uh, decisions about what style you call stuff. So it's, yeah, it, it's m much less tidy than people would like it to be. Um, but that's real life for you. Not very tidy, complicated, confusing, and a little bit scary. Old, old uh, beer recipes are often depressingly simple for for modern home brewers, because they have don't have a, a huge amount of ingredients in them. So, so most 19th century beers were just base malt, and depending on the period, some sugar and, and some unmalted grains, and nothing more than that. And I mentioned earlier that the sugar content was quite high in pale ales because people wanted to have a very pale colour and a very light body. And so they would use sugar because this would help them to achieve that. They weren't using it because it was cheap. These were in fact the most expensive beers that they had. Um, so it's not the way people often think about the use of sugar nowadays. It's just there's some bollock cheap ingredient. That's not the way it was used. Um, World War I sort of really messed around with British beer, knocked about 20% off strength um that never recovered again and and it starts confusing the difference between the old-fashioned stock bitters and the, and the newfangled sort of running light bitters and they start sort of merging into each other um start getting a bit of use of crystal malt but you don't really see that much until after world war ii um crystal malt never see it before world war one little in, in pale ales little bit in the interwar period in some beers but really a minority and then really becomes popular after World War II. So this is um, the, the, the thing you say there, uh, AK Hulls Family Owls, that's the only brewery I've ever worked in, the old Hulls Brewery in the town where I grew up in Newark. And AK was their standard bitter. So I've always had a very soft spot for, bit, for this. And so this is a style of beer that you have introduced 1840s, 1850s. So a new type of what they call light bitter or running bitter. So a lot weaker than the, than the pale ales, the full strength pale ales and IPAs. So probably about 1050. So about the strength of, a, of the weakest mild ales. And this was a, a new type of beer that was often put, pushed as, you often see it called a dinner ale or a luncheon ale. So it's something that we're saying, oh, it's just a light beer that you can eat with meals. See it called family ale as well. Um, so basically something that they're saying, oh, this is something you can consume in a, a domestic context, context often. Um, and basically modern bitter is mostly like these style of beers rather than like the, the full strength uh, IPAs and pale ales from, uh, from Burton. Um, the bottled versions you see them becoming light ale. Light ale is another virtually extinct British style. 
So it's like the bitter equivalent of uh, if if brown ale was bottled mild, light ale was bottled ordinary bitter. Um, used to be pretty common. Uh, often drunk as a mixer because people didn't dr trust draft beer very much. So people would have a half pint of draft bitter and then put a bottle of light ale in. Same way they do a half of mild and a half of brown ale. Um, really went out of fashion in the 1870s and 1880s. And I, yeah, light ale, I don't think it really exists anymore. Mild, which is used to be my favorite style. It's what I used to drink when I was younger. Um, probably just because it was unfashionable. I've always been a bit of a contrarian bastard. Um, so it doesn't mean what most people think nowadays. So most people think, oh, mild, it means not very bitter or not very strong. What it really means is unaged. So if you look at the older versions, they, they're all sorts of strands. So it, it's, it's changed a lot. Um, it really starts becoming a style in the early 19th century. Before that, it was just like a, a very vague term for conditioning but it starts to solidify into an actual specific or group of styles in the early 19th century, and then starts to become very, very popular, especially after 1830. Um, so by about the middle of the 19th century, it's the most popular style in Britain. Uh, people brew huge ranges of them. So, a very large percentage of breweries have brewed four different strengths mild ales from X to 4X. So the weakest would have been about 5%, the strongest about 10. So quite, quite powerful beers. Very simple, just 100% pale malt. Um, most of the recipes from before 1850, they're smash. It's just one type of hops, one certain type of base malt. Very, very simple beers, uh, which would have been sold quite young. <coughs> so really, quick high turnover stuff. So here's some examples from the uh, from the 1830s, and you can see they're um, quite strong. Uh, and I've thrown in an IPA there from Reed. Uh, uh, well, I realise now that IPA isn't actually from Reed. In fact, those beers aren't actually from Reed because they, the the records been miscatalogued. I actually don't know which brewery it's from. I, I suspect it might be Coombe, but I'm not sure. Um, one of the many frustrations of, of looking at archives is how often you realize that they've miscatalogued stuff. So, late 19th century, you start, in the lead up to World War I, you, you start seeing that the, the stronger miles disappear, particularly in London, after about 1880, 1890, they only brewed X and 2X and didn't brew 3X and 4X. So you see in the countryside, they were still brewing those up until World War I. And then it completely changes after World War I. Most breweries just go over to brewing a standard, one standard mild or maybe two miles. Um, but you can say that, you know, 1900, when I say 1900, 1050 to 1055, that's really London beers. When you look at country breweries, an ordinary X might have been as low as 1040 or even under that by that period. So there's a bit of a discrepancy depending on where you are. <coughs> but there are still fairly strong beers. Um, one of the biggest changes that you have in mild when you got going from the 19th to the 20th centuries is the change in colour. So what happens is that in the 1890s, you start seeing mild getting a little bit darker. So not really dark. So when you're talking about bitters being something like 10 or 12 SRM, no, not 10 or 12, it's like five or six SRM, then you've got milds being about 10 or 12. So not really dark, but a little bit dark. Um, so enough you could differentiate them from bitter, but not really like the dark beers that you know nowadays. And um, that only really happens after World War I when they start going properly dark, some of them. Uh, but again, very patchy. So different parts of the country, different colours. Um, London, they seem to go quite dark quite early. Um, other parts of the country, even after World War II, they weren't really all that dark. So it's very patchy. 
and the modern idea of dark mild is really only solidifies in the sort of 50s and 60s, the, the strength and the color. And if you go back before that, you they aren't quite the same as that. Um, so in the 20s, four and a bit percent was the average, uh, but that also varies. Again, London ones would tend to be that, but you don't also have these weaker versions of mild, which was sort of like the continuation of what they called government ale during the World War One, which was this price controlled, very watery uh, version of mild, which people weren't that impressed with, but that sort of lived on, I think, just because people wanted a very cheap drink. Um, so when, when I'm showing those two there, the one at 10.43, that would have been 60 pence, six pence a pint, and the one at 10.27, that would have been four pence. So quite a big price differential, 50%. Uh, 1931 was a bit of a disaster. He had a disastrous raise in the taxes in Britain, which sort of like completely messed up mild and really dropped down average mild to being about three and a half percent alcohol. Then World War II, that has another go. And that's how you end up with the three percent milds that you see nowadays. So they're very much a, a, a result of an external events during the 20th century. So World War I, Wall Street crash, World War II. And all three of those reduced the gravity of mild and left you with the fairly weak beer that you have nowadays. Um, some of the World War II recipes are weird. They've got lots of different stuff in them. Actually, much more complex and interesting recipes in some ways, but only because brewers were being forced to use stuff they wouldn't normally do, like oats, where they had a bumper crop in 1942. And so everyone had to use oats in all their beers in 1943 in Britain, 10% oats, whether they liked it or not. So stock ales, um, these are, these are sort of like the age versions of mild. So you have the two parallel things. You have ales, you have stock ales and mild ales. Mild ales sold young, stock ales which are aged. And <coughs> were, you had two parallel ranges. So you'd have X's for milds and K's for, for stock ales. At least this is a convention in London. And they'd be the same strength. So an XX would be the same strength as a KK. It's just the KK would the stock version would have 50% more hops because it was intended to be capped longer. Um, what you have in London is stock ale sort of develop into Birkdale, which is a, a thing on its own and which isn't necessarily connected with mild. It depends where you are. So you find somewhere like Fuller's where their where their, their, their burnt nails were partly galled with their mild, so essentially the same. Whereas some of the London brewers, they were brewed completely separately, so had quite different grists and were more heavily hopped generally. So it's quite inconsistent. And batch number one, that was an example of a Burton brew burnt nail, and that's the, the start of barley wine. And you see that being called barley wine first in, I think, 1870s, the first reference I have to it is barley wine. So quite a long way back. Um, but the, the gravities go down with everything. Um, if you know Young's Winter Warmer, that's until the 70s, that was still called Burton. And that's basically the last example of a London Burton ale. Um, so a dark, uh, reasonably strong beer that ended up mostly being sold in the winter. Though if you go back earlier in the 1950s, the Burton ales are, are sold year round. It's only later in their life that they become a winter seasonal and, and then mostly disappear. Um, brown ale is a weird one. It's, it basically didn't exist until quite recently. In, in fact, brown ale had a remarkably short life. So it only appears about 1900, the first bond brown ale, man's brown ale. I don't know the exact year, but it's about 1900. Before World War I, not many breweries make one. Becomes very popular in the 20s and 30s. Everyone makes them popular up until the 50s and 60s, and then becomes incredibly unfashionable and disappears. So in, in the UK, it only had a life of about 70 years, brown ale. Um, now incredibly rare. Um, so the original ones are, are, are very different. So if you look at 18th century brown ale, 
it's a completely different beer. Um, but then there's no connection between that and the modern ones. Uh, as for nut brown ale, nut brown ale is just a, it just comes from a common phrase, nut brown ale. Has nothing to do with nuts or even the colour of the beer. It's just a phrase you find in lots of old English songs. Just nut brown ale being a metaphor for really nice beer. And so brewers started using that in, as a name for beer, but it's actually completely meaningless. Um, brown ale in, in, in the UK has always been exclusively a bottled beer or near exclusively a bottled beer. Uh, I always find it weird when you see Newcastle Brown on draft in the States. That's weird. It's um, unnatural. Um, and one of the reasons Brown Ale became popular was because as a result of the gravity drops over the wars, draft beer became less reliable because it wasn't as strong and landlords couldn't get away with being as useless as looking at, at looking after as, as they had been. And so a lot of people started moving over to bottled beer. And so people who, who were mild drinkers, their natural haven would be brown ale, which <coughs> originally not really the case, but certainly later on, mostly breweries just bottled their mild. So when I look through brewing records, I've got very few of brown ale just because most people didn't brew brown ale as a brown ale. It's just, they just bottled their mild. So, it, it, it wasn't a separate brew. You do you do find some. I mean, some of the London brewers actually brewed proper separate beers as brown ale, and they were normally the stronger ones. Um, the whole thing about the nor nor northern and southern brown ale is it, sort of a bit deceptive because Whitbread, which is a London brewery, they brewed a, their original brown ale, and the one they brewed for quite a lot of years was called Double Brown, and that was more like what people would call a northern brown ale so it's quite strong it's like five and a half percent so not like the the watery normal brown ale so it's it's it's, it's very complex and there were uh, there's a huge variety of uh, brown ales especially in the 20s and 30s really wide variety of, of strengths and, and character um, and it only really becomes basically bottled mild completely in the 1940s and 50s um, yeah, I've just told you that. Uh, I don't need to go through that. Uh, oh, right. This is always also a really good one. Scottish beer. Um, most of the things normally said about Scottish beer is totally and utterly wrong. It's, it's, I still struggle to realise how people got it so wrong because when I investigated it, it came up with such different results. So all the things about long boils, low hopping, um, lo yeah, really cold fermentation, not true. Um, and it's complicated and it varies in the period you're looking at. So there were some periods where there were fairly long boils in Scottish beers. There's other periods where it was really short. Um, so up until the Act of Union in the early 18th century, Scotland was not much of a brewing country um, and initially the result of the Act of Union is you've got a lot of English porter coming into Scotland uh, but then you start the, the Scots start concentrating on um, strong ales and they get a bit of a market in England for these and um, this comes uh, and people start calling this Scotch ale or Edinburgh ale because a lot of it's brewed in Edinburgh which is where which is a big concentration of the Scottish brewing industry. Um, these are what I would call Scottish shilling ales. So when you see them in brewing records, they're normally just given by a number of shillings. Uh, this refers to the wholesale price for a 54 gallon hogshead. Um, it doesn't imply any sort of style. It own, when you see 60 shilling or 80 shilling, all it means is it tells you the relative strength of the beer. Um, so they went up to 160 shilling, which were crazily strong beers. You're looking at gravities of 11.30, 11.40 and things like that. Very simple, 100% uh, pale malt. Uh, um, weirdly, often sold in bottled form. So they'd be filled into hogsheads and then sent out to pubs and grocers who bottle them themselves. So 
quite different to what went on in England. And um, this will give you some idea of the strengths. So these are William Younger's ones. So William Younger's was, was one of the largest breweries in, in Edinburgh for a very long period of time. Um, and you can see that the fermentation temperatures, they're not that crazily low. They're getting over 60, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're generally similar to the English fermentation temperatures. A lot of them were pitched quite cool, but only because they were quite strong. And so usually, because you're going to generate heat during fermentation, brewers would pitch the stronger beers at a lower temperature. And so because a lot of the Scottish beers were quite strong, they were pitched at quite low temperatures, but they still got up to the normal range of fermentation temperatures. So they were still getting up to over 65 generally, um, and sometimes over 70 degrees. So yeah, not very lager-like. <coughs> The, the initial, initially, they, they had very short boils because they wanted to keep the colour pale. So I'm, I'm, I've got examples of some really strong William Younger's ones where they're only boiled for an hour, which is really short. Usually, you look at, at that period, you were looking at least an hour and a half, and for stronger beers, normally at least two hours. So that was quite unusual that just how short the boils were on some of them. Um, this sort of beer... The last sighting I've got of one of these strong shilling ales is a uh, William Younger's ones from after what Younger one a two hundred shilling from after World War One, but that's the last one. Mostly they seem to have been killed off. They were already disappearing before World War One, but it seems to have really uh, put the nail in their coffin and they completely disappeared. Um, yeah, IPA. People don't necessarily associate Scotland with IPA, but it was one of the big IPA exporters from two centres, Edinburgh and Alloa, where they were really big into pale ale brewing. And they exported loads of it all over the world. Um, and yeah, it was quite heavily hot. Later on, it dropped down a bit, but it was still pretty heavily hot beer. And just like the, <coughs> the, Scot the traditional Scottish ales, it was often designated by a number of shillings. So you'd have 54 shilling pale ale, 60 shilling pale ale, uh, 70 shilling uh, pale ale. So the whole shilling thing doesn't tell you anything about the style of the beer. It only tells you about the, its relative strengths. Scotch ales, uh, William Younger seems to have deliberately introduced in the middle of the 19th century beers, mimicking the ones from Burton, so numbered ales. So they had something that was number one to number four, which is much like what, what they had in the, the strong Burton ales brewed in Burton. And yeah, they seem to have de deliberately been imitating that. Number three is a, is a remarkably long-lived beer, which had been brewed up until quite recently. Um, it's a beer I've drunk. In fact, it was one of the first beers I home brewed was a clone of Younger's number three. Um, <coughs> and this was a, yeah, a dark sort of medium strand. So later on in the 20th century, something was about four or five percent, depending on the period, um, and, and which in London was sold as the equivalent of draft burnt nail. What you find in, after World War I is mild pretty much disappears from Scotland. And so what people brew is basically just pale ale. Um, when I first looked at Scottish brewing records, I was amazed at just how boring they were. And most of the breweries in the 20th century, they had one recipe and they'd party gal three or four beers out of it. So three different strength pale ales and a stronger Scotch ale, and that would be it. And they'd brew the same recipe every single day and just party gal it into whatever they wanted of those particular beers. So really, really boring. Um, and so these pale ales, they eventually become what's now 60, 70 and 80 shilling. So they're basically just different strength pale ales and they don't taste much like pale ales because Scottish brewers really dropped down the hopping rates in the 20th century. And so they're all sort of like mild ales in a way, but um, the, the, the other thing, the weird thing that the Scottish breweries did was that, I always used to think 60 shilling was mild, 
because they're the only examples I ever had were dark. But Scottish brewers used to colour up their beers in loads and loads of different ways. And so you would have the same beer, which would go from being as brewed, which would be like a pale bitter colour, to virtually black, depending on where they were selling it. And they do this not just with the 60 shilling, but with the 70 and 80 shilling. <coughs> so you'd have something that was basically a bitter that could have been black, just because they'd uh, coloured it up with caramel at racking time. And here's some ones from the uh, 1920s. Some, some, this is another Edinburgh brewery. This is an example. That these are the four pale ales they brewed then, all brewed to the same recipe. And these are basically um, the different price categories. So these are like six, seven, eight, and nine pence beers a pint at the time. Bloody mosquito. Um, and that's me done for now. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Ron. We're, we're, uh, we definitely had a few questions in the, the chat here, some a little more recently, but I'm going to go back uh, a little further back up towards the, the top here. And, you know, Sean was asking the question about the distinction between IPA versus pale ale. And if that was really basically just uh, fundamentally a marketing decision. Yeah. Great. So yes I've, no? I've, I've, I've not been able to find any logic in it. So if you were asking me to define what made an IPA or a pale ale in the 19th century, I couldn't tell you. Or in the 20th century for that matter. It's just purely arbitrary what the brewer called them. A um, question I was um, wondering a little bit about, you talked about um, to uh, that, you know, the distinction between porter and stout uh, is is really negligible. <laughs> and and uh, I, that gets me thinking, um, you know, that uh, that kind of talk wouldn't fly in the BJCP, uh, Beer Judge Certification Program. So, so to what extent is there, um, has maybe like this, the, the the creation of the definition of these these styles in accordance to the BJCP is that in turn in any way influencing um, the definition of British beer styles in England today? Yeah, it's had an influence on on, on people today. Um, I've been trying to fight against it, but uh, <laughs> as best I can. But but yeah, it's had an influence on people. I mean, I mean yeah, people think that 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 these are you know official hard and fast definitions. Um, it's, 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 it's not the BJCP's fault. It's people who misinterpret and misuse what they produced. They are, I mean, I mean if you, I mean, I, I, I know some of the people in the BJCP very well. I'm quite good mates with Gordon Strong. Um, and he, he doesn't think, oh, people should be using them as the, the definitions uh, for you know, definitive way that you look at beer styles um, and they're realistic about that, you know, this is, you know, it's a convenience for competitions. Uh, but there have been loads of people who've completely overinflated what they are and, yeah, get very angry when you argue with them. I've, I've, I've had plenty of these arguments, but I've chilled out as I've got older. Uh, I saw a quick question from Frank up there. If if you think maybe the original IPA would be a Brett IPA, yeah, definitely. Um, just because of the way it was produced and analyses I've seen, the level of 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 attenuation, yeah, Britannomyces beers. I, 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 I keep saying to people, the closest modern beer that's commercially produced regularly to a 19th century IPA is Orval. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, let's see. Um, Faraday asked a question here. I don't know to what extent if you covered any of this a little, a little earlier. You're talking about Burton Pale Ales and um, Faraday is asking, you know, what, 
what makes a Burton pale ale? Are there particular regional hop preferences in pale ale and IPAs in the 19th and 20th centuries? And also I was wondering about the, um, the usage of foreign hop varieties. Um, okay. I, I can only talk from, uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen a whole load of, of different bass of, of Burton records. Unfortunately, the, the world seems to be conspiring to stop me ever getting, ever see the bass records. Um, but what I have seen, they're, they're just like everywhere else. They use, they use a variety of different hops. Hops don't grow around Burton. It's not in a hop region. So whereas the, the London brewers did, especially early on, mostly have hops from Kent or Sussex, which are fairly local, but never had that luxury because they don't grow hops around Burton. So they, they'd have used hops from everywhere. And, and the Burton records I have seen, they use American hops, they use continental hops, just because they couldn't get the quantity of, of UK hops because they weren't there. Pit brewers were forced to use imported hops they might not use them for the flavor editions that they, they you know the, the standard thing is that you keep all the you know the really nice uh golding like hops for for the flavor editions and for the dry hopping but for the early bittering editions then you'd throw in the the cheaper maybe not so nice tasting hops um and and, and with the classier beers and then you do say sometimes that they're using 100 percent goldings or you know, 100% fresh Kent hops, but it, it, it varies and it depends what they had available. Talking about bread also has me thinking uh, if there's evidence for any kind of like a, a farmhouse tradition in England, um, to what extent there might be brewers who are using uh, uh, just heirloom cultivated wild yeasts like like thinking about like the kvik traditions in, in Norway and Scandinavia um right uh, um home brewing never died out in Britain so people were always home brewing um but you don't seem to have had a real uh hangover of of specific yeast varieties or stuff like that like in like in the farmhouse brewing in in Norway. I mean, domestic brewing in terms of um, brewing in farmhouses was really big in Britain in the 19th century. And so when you're looking at the early 19th century, it's like 25%, 25, 30% of all the beer is brewing, brew, being brewed non-commercially. So just by people either in farmhouses or at home, quite a high percentage, but, but the, Specific yeast varieties and stuff like that don't seem to have survived. I mean, I'm guessing that the later home brewers in Britain were probably just using bread yeast um, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, I know what I did when I was brewing in the in the 1970s. I just me and my brother we just used Guinness yeast because that was easy to get hold of. We, we, I mean, we had two sources of yeast when, when we were home brewing, either bottled Guinness because it was bottle conditioned and had really active yeast in it, or just go to a pub, buy a pint of cask beer, pour it into a bottle, stick some sugar in it, leave it for a week, and then it had re-ferment. You got some beer to drink and you got yeast in the bottom and you got the and you've got the primary yeast of the brewery. So, I mean, but yeah, no, the, the, the specific things, but I mean, it, it's very different in, in Norway because they're, you know, you've got all these very isolated things. It's, it's quite a different culture, but home brewing was, was definitely very much a thing that never died out in the UK. So uh, any more questions? Yeah, there was a question, I think, a little earlier up. Um, you mentioned a little something about pale stout, uh, uh, if, if you did, or could you expand a bit on that? Pale? Oh, stout. yeah, pale stout. 
Yeah, yeah, well, uh, it was definitely a think pile step. But it's, you have to realize what the 18th century terminology means. So stout, all stout means is strong. So the original stouts were all, what we would think of as stout nowadays. The original name for them was brown stout. So it was a strong beer brewed from 100% uh, brown malt. You also had pale stout, which was the same thing, but just brewed with pale malt. And so I've got a recipe for this. Um, luckily, the very first Barclay Perkins brewing record that they've got in the archives has an example of pale stout, which they, they seem to have discontinued about 1805. But it's, yeah, it's a simple beer. It's 100% pale malt, brewed to stout strength and with stout hopping. So it's, it's, it's very much a thing, but, but it's people nowadays, they think stout, oh, well, stout's a dark beer, but that's, the old terminology was different. So stout didn't imply anything dark. It just, it just said it was a strong beer. Uh, I got a question. Somebody was asking me um, if you've ever come across the brewing records from Timothy Taylor's. Ah, ah. <laughs> no, that, there's someone I should maybe ask um, because I've, I've I've been lucky enough to get into several breweries and, and look at their brewing records. Um, the, the one I'm most pleased about was Fuller's because now their records are not accessible anymore since they were taken over by Asahi and I managed to get in and, and photograph a good chunk of them. Um, but Timothy Taylor's, no, I'd be interested in looking at those because I do like Timothy Taylor's beer. I really like Landlord. I think it's a cracking beer. Uh, I should maybe just ask them. Because they, they, they're quite good, actually. M most of the breweries I've asked have let me look at their records. So though some of them do make me sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, there's quite a few uh, currently active UK breweries I've looked at the records from. So. Timothy Taylor's would be an interesting one because, um, well, they're Yorkshire and I don't have many Yorkshire records and I do like their beer, so. So that's, that's actually a thought, maybe we should get in touch with them. Well, I'm sure, Ron, if you ask, doors will open. <laughs> well, mostly. Um, well, they, the only people who've ever told me to get lost were Guinness. Um, but then they changed their archive, so I have actually been to Guinness since and been in their archive, which was pretty fascinating. Um, and I wish I'd had longer in there and had a chance to photograph more stuff, but con considering how secretive Guinness can be, I, I was amazed they, uh, they let me in there at all. We are, we're definitely well past our, the, the time we thought, but we definitely want to get to a couple more questions here. Uh, thanks everybody for resubmitting the questions. Yeah, they do get a little buried in the chat here. So I uh, appreciate that though. But uh, Keldling Brew is asking, um, what's the story about mild malt? Um, since mild malt um, uh, was made with pale malt. And second, what about white malt? Uh, okay, so white malt was, that was just the palest of pale malt. Um, so that was probably something that would be closer to modern pale malt, I would guess. Um, mild malt, generally mild malt was like made from slightly lesser quality barley, kilned a little bit darker, um, and not just used in mild. This is one of the things, you say. it always cracks me up when I, when I look at um, some modern homebrew recipes, and you see someone's brewing this imperial stout and they're using specifying Maris Otter as the base malt. Well, in the past, that's not what anyone would have done because you're not going to taste it. And so what you often see in the, in the uh, porters and stouts is they'll use mild malt as the base malt because it was cheaper and you weren't going to taste it anyway, really, with all the roasted malts in there. And so why, why bother using the classiest 
base malt when it wasn't going to have any impact on the, on the finished beer. Whereas with pale ales, which were where the malt was going to, the base malt was going to shine much more, that's where you use the classy malts. So you see mild malt used all over the place. Um, and it's just basically a cheap and cheerful form of base malt. Um, just maybe uh, one last question here uh, is, and then, um, yeah, so I, I think, let's see here, sorry, I just lost track of Faraday. Yeah, Faraday was asking again, uh, it, how many breweries are, uh, are still using classic multi-strains around nowadays? And um, is, is that, sorry, uh, if I'm mischaracterizing your question, Faraday, you can certainly uh, unmute yourself and just ask it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, otherwise, um, I think something also I was at, I wondering myself about, Ron, is that you've mentioned earlier on the uh, frustration you encountered looking at archives and wondering if to what extent maybe sometimes they're just maybe miscategorizing anything. And so if you have any, just thinking from the perspective of a a museum, the Chicago Museum, if you have any advice, requests, or suggestions for archivists or, or anyone today who's trying to preserve beer history, what might you uh, share? <laughs> um, well, get someone who understands what the things are to look at them. Because, yeah, it's the problem that archivists, they have all sorts of different documents and they're not brewing specialists, so they don't necessarily understand what the documents are. Um, and I can understand why that is, they're quite specialized. So it's a bit frustrating sometimes to see how misclassified they are. Um, the, I keep meaning to tell them about this, the, the um, Whitbread records at the London Metropolitan, Ar Metropolitan Archives, they haven't got the catalog right and they, I'm the only person who has the right catalogue for the Whitbread records. And I keep meaning to tell them the, the, the mistake they've got because they they got the numbers wrong because there was a bit where they went from, from brewing year to calendar year. And so there's an extra brewing record that's only six months and they don't, haven't taken that into account. And so they got all the numbers and years wrong after that. So everything after about 1933 and the Whitbread Ale Brewing records catalogs is wrong in in the archive. I really should tell them that, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, no, it, it, it's I, I understand why they get it wrong, and, I, and, I, and I've learned when I'm looking through archives to uh, arch archive catalogs to realize how they might have misunderstood what these things are, mm -hmm. Be because it's not always that obvious what stuff is. Um, if, if, if you, you know, not an expert in that field. So, so you know, it's, I, I don't blame them, but it just means you have to, it just makes it more fun digging around until you find the actual stuff you're looking for. You know, it makes it a bit of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I think that's probably a, a great place to, uh, to begin to close here. Um, I know there, there's certainly a lot more on the minds of, of everybody tuning in. And um, Ron, did you, would you suggest any, uh, any good um, readings or, or any uh, books or other sources to go to if people want to dig more into the history of, 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 uh, of English and British brewing? Well, obviously any of my books, which, yeah. are, which are all excellent and very reasonably priced considering the amount of time it took me to put them together. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to my, uh, my blog, which is um, oh, yeah. shut, up, shut Up About Barclay Perkins, it's uh, fairly easy to remember. Um, yeah, you can find links there to my books. I've produced, yeah, several incredibly long and detailed books <laughs> with all, the, all this stuff that fascinates me, um, which probably, I don't know, some other people seem to find it interesting seeing as I had to sell some. So, But yeah, I mean, if, if you're really interested in the details of it, my books are pretty good. Martin Cornell, he's written a couple of pretty good books. Um, 
Yeah, there's lots of other beer history, which is decidedly more shaky. Um, but yeah, and my, my, my classic book, The Home Brewer's Guide to Vintage Beer, which is what this um, talk was based on. This is basically a, 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 the uh, presentation version of that book. Um, so it's got, it goes into a little bit more detail, but if you want, so if you want to not go crazy, it's a good one, but if you want to go completely crazy, then, uh, you know, something like uh, my book, uh, Armistice or uh, Austerity, go into various periods of British brewing in way more detail. Um, I'm, I'm currently getting completely bogged down writing something way too long about World War II brewing, which is a, uh, yeah, it's 760 pages at the moment. I could probably do with a little bit of editing. Look forward to diving into that one. Yeah, and I did. I posted a link to uh, to your your uh, your website, BarclayPerkins.blogspot.com, into the chat room. So I encourage people to check that out. Yeah, and and I mean, I mean, if you you know anyone wants to ask any other questions, you can just send me one on Twitter. So mm -hmm. I, that's just uh, what I'm on Twitter. Pato Pato One R O. Mm -hmm. and, so, P A T T O one R O. Pretty sure that's me. Uh, and you'll uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to answer questions because I'm weirdly fascinated with all this stuff and I'm quite happy to, to to explain it to anyone else who's who's willing to listen to me. That that that's why my blog school shut up about Michael Perkins because my family got so fed up about me talking about beer history. Fantastic. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Ron. And Liz, if you have anything more to chime in, thank you, Liz, as always, Liz Garby, for putting all of these uh, virtual happy hour sessions together. Liz Garby, the founder and executive director of the Chicago Museum. I'm just uh, the one pulling some technical strings behind the curtain here. <laughs> um, and uh, I certainly hope everybody can Join us on Tuesday. Uh, that's our next virtual happy hour. Tuesday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 5.30 p.m. Central Time. Cesaro Moreno from the National Museum of Mexican Art, cur Chief Curator, is going to be leading a conversation about the history of Cinco de Mayo. So that'll be really interesting. Uh, and once again, Ron, thank you so much. This was just amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, cheers. Uh, and uh, happy. Well, cheers, everyone. Okay, cheers. And uh, we certainly hope we'll be able to have you back sometime in the future, uh, maybe face to face in person. Uh, and uh, everyone, be well during uh, during this this difficult period, uh, and uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, yeah, power on. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>